Now, your first example of using Docker is to use the Docker CLI to temporarily spin up a container. Now, for this example, I'm going to run this Pokemon Cacher API that caches responses from the Pokey API inside of a Redis database. Now, uh, to run this locally, I would need Node, NPM, and Redis. I don't have Redis, so there's a few ways to go about getting it. Now, the first way is to just install it on my local machine, and the instructions are going to vary depending on what operating system I'm on. I could also install it on a remote machine like a Linux VPS and then connect to that remote instance. I could also spin up a cloud instance, but I might actually have to pay for that cloud instance and then connect to that cloud instance. Or I could use Docker to run Redis locally inside of a container. Now let's get this app running on my machine. If you'd like to follow along, the link to this repo will be in the description and you can just clone it down and follow along with what I'm doing. So I'm gonna clone this here in this directory and then go through the setup, which tells me that I need to do an NPM install. Great, and then I need to create my own environment variable file. So I will run this command, then we'll open this up with VS Code and edit it further. We can see that this example.env is attempting to connect to Redis here on my local machine on port 6379. And if we try to start up the app, let's just do an npm run dev, we will see that it's attempting to connect to Redis, but there is no instance running on port 6379 on my machine. So let's fix that by running Redis with the Docker CLI. Now for any type of image that you're looking for, you can always use Docker Hub. There are other sites as well, but Docker Hub has all of the official images listed. And for example, we're on the Redis image here, but if you wanted to run MySQL locally, there is a MySQL image. If you wanted to run a uh, Postgres, there is a Postgres image. Um, pretty much any, any major service that you can think of, there is an image already on Docker Hub that you can just run locally. So uh, for any of those images, take a look at their page on Docker Hub, and they typically have just like a one-liner that you can run that will actually start up that container. So let's actually just run this command and see what happens. So first, if you've never pulled this image before, it is gonna have to pull that image down and then it's gonna save it onto your machine. But after it has pulled the image, the container is actually running. And if you run Docker PS, you can see there is a container running. However, we have not exposed the port the Docker PS will tell you that, hey, this container is uh, listening on port 6379, but we need to expose that to our local machine. Uh, you can also see this inside of Docker Desktop. So if you pull up Docker Desktop, you'll see that there is a Redis container running. Um, also, if you take a look at images, you'll see that image that it downloaded. And then also most images also have some sort of volume associated with them. And this is where they're storing uh, the data for that specific containers because containers are temporary, but any changes are saved in this volume here. Um, but if I want to connect to this, I'm going to need to expose that port. So the first thing I'll do is actually, I will just stop and kill this container. And then I want to create a new container that actually exposes that port so I can connect to it on my local machine. Now, uh, to figure out what port that is, you can always look at the docs for whatever service you're using. We know that Redis runs on port 6379. So we're going to add that into the command here. So if you run the command they gave you, but you also add a dash P. So dash P stands for exposing a port. And in this case, we want to expose port 6379 on our local computer. And we want to uh, link that to 6379 running inside of the container. Now, if you already have something running on your machine on 6379, you could pick a different port like that. Um, but this, this is just the port that will be available on your machine. So in the codes here, I, I could set this to anything I wanted, but I would just need to make sure that that matches this value here. But now when I run the container, it will expose that port. The other option you see here is dash D that stands for detached. Uh, but if we wanted to run in the foreground to actually see the logs, we can actually just remove that dash D and now try running it. So there we go. Redis is running and the port is exposed. Now to check this, we can use Docker PS. So if we do Docker PS, we'll see that the container is running, um, but you definitely want to see this. This actually tells you that the port is exposed. So this is the port inside the container. And then this is how it's exposed on your local machine. So now if I start up my Node.js app, it should be able to connect to that port, but we're getting a different error now. Now it's saying that we have the wrong username and password. Now to find or set this username and password, you can usually look at the docs for any, any container that you're running locally, but this Redis instance actually is running in non-protected mode, which means we can connect without a username and password. So for this specific use case and this specific type of container that I'm running, I'm just gonna remove the username and password and then try starting up my app again.
Great. So now the Redis container is running on 6379. We have our Node.js app running on 5000, and I should be able to visit it, it in the web browser. Cool. And then if we look at the docs for this API, we can see that slash API v1 slash Pokemon is what we can use. And then we'll just specify a Pokemon name like Pikachu. And we get back the response. So we know that this API is running and it's able to cache those responses inside of Redis. Now, there are a few other things we can do with this container here. So I showed you earlier, we have the Docker PS command. This will show me all of my running containers. And you can reference a container by its ID or its friendly name. And in our case, when we started it up, we gave it a friendly name. So if I do a Docker stop of some Redis, that will actually stop the container. And then you can see that node is freaking out because it doesn't have anything to connect to. If I want to start it back up, I can do Docker start, pass in the name, that'll start it back up. And then Node.js should start to connect to it and, and not throw errors anymore. Um, but you might want to be able to see the logs inside of that container. So if you do Docker logs and then specify the container name, that'll spit out all of the recent logs. Now, uh, the other thing you can do is you can follow these logs. So right now this just spits it out and then gives me back my terminal. If I pass in a dash F, this will just stay there and any new logs that come in, you'll see those happen as well. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with the CLI, and even I don't have these me these commands memorized. I had to look them up for this video. Um, but if you want to learn more, check out the docs. They have the docs on the main Docker CLI command, but it's important to note that there are a bunch of subcommands. And so specifically, there is the container subcommand, and that is actually where things like start and stop and logs, that's where all of these subcommands come from. They're just alias, so they're they're easier to run. But if you want to control your containers from the command line, you can look here for all of the other commands that you can use. Now, personally, I just use Docker Desktop because it's super easy to just go click the stop button, click the play button. I don't have to memorize any sort of commands or anything like that. Um, and then the other thing that's nice is when you remove a container here, behind the scenes, it automatically removes any like associated volumes. You don't have to run special commands for that. Um, but you, you can go either way. You can use Docker Desktop. You can use the CLI. Now, in the next section of this video, I'm going to show you how we actually don't even have to use the CLI at all, uh, because if we want this to be a reusable process, right? Let's say there are other people on our team. We want them to be able to run Redis locally. Technically, we could put this little command here in our readme, and then you can tell other people, hey, just go run this command and you'll get yourself a Redis container. But a better way to kind of like wrap that up and make it reusable is with Docker Compose. And Docker Compose is typically how I use Docker and how I'm even interfacing with, with Docker that's running on my machine. Next, let me show you a quick and easy example of Docker Compose. So take this command that we ran earlier where essentially we specified an image name from Docker Hub and then we ran it and we exposed a port. We can replicate that inside of a Docker Compose. So here in my code base, I'm gonna create a file called docker-compose.yaml. And then inside of here, I'll specify my services. Now, I'm getting autocomplete. That's because I have the Docker extension installed inside of VS Code. I recommend it. And then from here, we can specify all of our services. In this case, I just have one service. You can give it a name. Uh, if we wanted the exact example, we could call it some Redis, but I like to be a bit more descriptive. So I'm just going to call this DB. And then uh, we specify the image that we want. Now, from the command line, we said the image name was Redis. So I'll add that here. And then from the command line, we also said that the port exposes 6379. So there's a ports option in here and we can just do 6379 and 6379. And there we go. And so I would actually commit this file to source code so that other developers can instantly spin up this Redis instance. Because now that we have this file, I can just do a Docker compose up. It'll look at that file, see all of the images that I need, spin up all the containers that I need and I'm good to go. And then if I kill this, it's gonna stop all of those containers and, and I'm, I'm done. So uh, this is honestly the, the most of how I interact with Docker is I just have compose files that specify all of the images that I need to run and also like custom images, which we'll talk about in a later section in this video. Now, uh, an important thing to note here is the image section here. When you specify just the image name bare like this, it's just using the latest version of that image. And pretty often you want to specify a specific version. And so on the Docker Hub page, you can see all of the versions that are available. And for instance, we might just pick the latest, which is 7.2.4. So I might just lock this down and say, pull the 7.2.4 image. 
And now, just in case there's like breaking changes in the latest version, our, our compose file at least locks it down to a specific version. Now, there's a few other things we can do in this file. We'll, we'll get more into it uh, later in this video. But for now, one thing of note is that you can also use environment variables. So for instance, we have this environment variable Redis port that we want to use. And if you want to use that inside of a compose file, you can just do dollar sign, curly braces, and then the environment variable name. Now, by default, Docker will look at the current folder. And if it sees a .env file, it's actually going to read in those environment variables. You don't have to do anything special. But now this is actually linked to our environment here. So if I were to specify a different port here, uh, now when we spin up the container, it's going to expose that port instead. And because I specified it inside of that .env file, my Node.js app is actually also going to use that port to connect to the service. And so everything is still working here as well. This next example will be a slightly more complicated use of the Docker CLI and then also Docker Compose. So for this, I want to run this API called Backpack Debuggers. It's part of the Backpack Debuggers game, and it gives you an API. It's running Node.js and Express, and it has a few more requirements. So we're also going to need the Image Magic CLI, and we're going to need a Postgres database. So I'm just going to get this thing cloned down locally, and then we'll try to get it running by spinning up a, a Docker container with Postgres inside. So. Let's clone it down. And then if we look at the docs, they say we should run an npm install. So let's do that. And from there, we will create an example.env file. And now we need a database in order to migrate and seed it. So if I open up VS Code here, and then we take a look at the .env, we're going to need a Postgres database that allows us to connect it with connect to it with this info. So if we look at Docker Hub for Postgres, uh, similar to like the, the Redis image that we saw earlier, uh, they give us a, a nice little CLI command that we can run. But it's going to be a little more complicated than this because we have other environments.